how true it is that the crucifixion of cross although sounds and looks so grievous but that has brought joy to you and to me is the death of Jesus that has given life to each one of us and it indeed brings us the message of hope even today and eternity eternally amen so it's it's always good to celebrate what Jesus has done and uh, and once again i just want to thank you thank you for this uh, uh, for this obedience of uh, whatever god is putting in your heart and i just want to encourage you uh, during during the uh, worship with songs if anyone gets any word not only at that time but if you get any word during the week just feel free to speak it out uh, because you never know who is in this room who needs to hear that okay and just know that this is this is your heavenly father's house this is your heavenly father's house so be here with authority are you with me be here with authority know that this place belongs to you this does not belong to anyone else but it belongs to you and to your heavenly father so speak with boldness speak with confidence speak to serve someone amen so if there is any hesitation in your in in your heart just rebuke it and speak what spirit of god puts in your heart right keep doing that and let's grow as a family i i want to push that uh, uh, that culture of family and when i say that i really mean that and uh, yeah let's get into the word amen so we we are into chapter 24 and last sunday we had seen the role of parents in children's life because we were into verse uh yeah we were into verse 1 and 2 and then i had said that there are three things that i see about uh the first nine verses of chapter 24 and last sunday we had seen the first first thing in this nine verses and that was role of parents in children's life today we are going to see the second thing in this nine verses and the second thing that i want to bring before you would be found in chapter 24 verse 3 and 4 so i'm going to request rebecca if she can please put on screen genesis chapter 24 verses 3 and 4 and we are going to see some wonderful things in verses 3 and 4 so we are still uh with abraham and when he is talking and when he is preparing for the marriage of his son isaac and this is what verse 3 and 4 reads for us and it says and i will make you so he is talking to his oldest servant of his house right that's what verse 2 says so i'm reading for you from verse 2 it says so abraham said to the oldest servant to of his house who rolled over all that he had please put your hand under my thigh and then verse 3 reads and i will make you swear by the lord the god of heaven and the god of earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the canaanites among whom i dwell but you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac So we're going to study these three verses verse 2 verse 3 and verse 4 and this is such an interesting part So when Abraham is 140 years old and now he is he is working on getting a wife for his 40 year old son Isaac and this is what he does First thing that he does is he has invited his oldest servant of his house who used to rule over everything that he had and then he makes him take a oath with Abraham 
and the way he takes the oath is is very interesting because we get all details how he had asked him to take the oath and then we get to hear the words of oath as well and my personal view is if anything is put in the word of god there should be something for me to learn and that's what i want to share with you so to begin with first thing that we get to know here in these three verses is he calls his oldest servant so abraham if you can put verse 2 please we get to read that abraham calls his oldest servant of his house and he is expecting something from his oldest servant and the first question is who is this oldest servant if you come to chapter 15 verse 2 and 3 you will get to know who he is talking about so in Genesis chapter 15 verse 2 and 3 this is what it reads let me read this for you it says but Abraham said now Abraham is talking to God okay but Abraham said Lord God what will you give me seeing I go childless and the hair of my house is Eliezer of Damascus then Abraham said look you have given me no offspring indeed one born in my house is my one born in my house is my heir so this oldest servant about whom God uh, Abraham is speaking and asking to take oath is no one else but Eliezer now Eliezer is uh, is born and is senior even to Ishmael and Isaac so before Ishmael and Isaac had come into Abraham's life Eliezer was there and as per the culture whoever was the eldest eldest uh, son from any concubine or, or, or among the servants who was the eldest he was gonna get all the property of the boss and so Eliezer was the one who was supposed to get the whole property of Abraham and Eliezer knew that and just just imagine the situation of Eliezer Eliezer knows that he would be the one who will be receiving all the property and we know Abraham was a rich rich man so Eliezer knew that he would be the one next heir of this all property and then Ishmael is born and then Isaac is born so by now Eliezer is pretty much clear that this is not belonging to me I'm just gonna be taking care of this property okay but Eliezer had a very close relationship with Abraham Eliezer was always close to Abraham in one of the commentaries I had read the two men whom Abraham had taken on his journey to sacrifice Isaac you remember when Abraham had taken Isaac to sacrifice him he had chosen two men to be with him and one of the commentator commentator says these two men were no one else but Ishmael and Eliezer these were the two who were chosen by Abraham to join him and be with him when he is on his journey to sacrifice Isaac so Eliezer always had very very close relationship with Abraham and here comes a very crucial moment in his life a responsibility is being given to Eliezer by his boss Abraham and now next thing uh, which is interesting part which I wanted to bring before you is the way the the oath has been taken and it is said that uh, Abraham had called Eliezer and he had asked him to put his hand under his thigh and then take the oath okay so he puts his hand under the thigh and then he takes the oath and what was the oath the oath was that you are gonna get wife for my son Isaac not from the Canaanites but from my own family well let me talk about the oath you know that was again the culture at that time because that's what we also read what Joseph uh, Jacob did with Joseph come to Genesis chapter 47 and let's read 29 to 31 Genesis 47 verses 29 to 31 and this is what it reads 47 29 
When the time drew near that Israel must die, now Israel is Jacob, okay? Israel must die. He called his son Joseph and said to him, Now, if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. So here again we see Israel or Jacob is asking his son Joseph to take an oath for him. And the way the oath was taken is the same style like Abraham had taken with Eliezer. Putting his hand under his thigh and asking him to take the oath. I don't think we, we follow any of that culture here, or uh, I don't remember any of such culture was followed in India. But that was the culture at that time. Okay? But I just want to bring this point, because uh, taking oath or, uh, or giving a promise uh, can be quite natural in our communication. But there is something that Bible speaks about it, and I don't want to miss that. And that's something we find in James chapter 5. Would you mind coming to James chapter 5 verse 12? So if there is any time when you have to take oath, if there is any time when you have to give some promising word to someone, this is what the wisdom would be. Use this word for yourself. James chapter 5 verse 12 reads, But above all, my brethren, <laughs> this is what the word of God says, do not swear, okay, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. That's the commandment of the word of God. Do not swear in any ways, okay, then what should we do? But let your yes be yes and your no be no. Pretty clear, very easy, no gray area, no black and white, oh, no, no gray area, just absolutely black or white. No for no, yes, yes. But then there is something that he's, he says next. Lest you fall into judgment. <laughs> Taking oath and then not being able to fulfill again can be a problem. If you had been uh, on last Sunday, we were studying about prayer, and the Bible so clearly teaches us that if you have taken any oath before God, ensure that you fulfill it, because otherwise your prayers will not be answered. That can be one of the reasons why your prayers are not getting answered. But the best culture that you and I should follow would be, let our yes be yes and no be no. You know what, let me, say, just, let me just share this. Since coming to New Zealand, I really, really appreciate the culture of the, the Kiwi culture because I literally see this happening here. And I say this, hold on, just don't, don't, don't conclude anything. I say this because I come from India. And we struggle so much in India in communication. It is so difficult at times to really understand what the other person is trying to mean. Because, because the culture itself is such that you literally need to keep waiting so that the other person can come to the point exactly what that person is expecting from you. You just need to keep waiting till they finish the entire talk. But that's not how it is in New Zealand. And I appreciate that so much. I just love that part. I, I don't hesitate to say about that. So many times I have said that and I will continue to say that because it is so good. When you say yes, it means yes. And when you say no, it means no. There should not be any gray area. And ask me, we know what gray area means. We understand that. And therefore this verse means so much to me. Having said that, I also want to let you know that the word that we, had, you, read, that we had read here, lest you shall fall into judgment. In Greek, it is hupokrosis, H-U-P-O-K-R-O-S-I-S. 
which actually is the root word for the English word hypocritic. So the original Greek word used there is hypocrisis, H-U-P-O-K-R-I-S-I-S. And that's what the word actually means. Lest you fall or you become hypocrite. Therefore, let your yes be yes and no be no. Let there be no need to take an oath. Are you with me? It's wonderful, isn't it? So, so Eliezer is someone whom, uh, whom Abraham had chosen. Eliezer was very close to Abraham, and Eliezer was a heir of uh, was a heir of his uh, his property, and he is the oldest one. And now comes the most important part of this promise of this oath, chapter twenty-four, and we get into the word three. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Last Sunday, I was trying to stress on this. Dear brothers and sisters, let us teach our children how to select partner or how to select a spouse for themselves. It is a need, it is, it is required that we teach our children how to select spouse for themselves. When, when, when we read here that Abraham was asking and he was making it sure with Eliezer that just be sure that you are, gone, you are not going to take wife from Canaanites, but you are going back to my people and getting a wife from there. Your brothers and sisters, uh, it, it may just sound like, a, like something like a story, but this particular factor has been given so much significance in the Word of God. It is not only in the Old Testament, but it is also in the New Testament. The right way Paul puts it is by using the words, do not be unequally yoked. That's what is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, so clearly tells us. And it is so important because that is not only applicable in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 reads, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And this is an important concept, very, very important rule for Christians. And I'm, I'm just going to make a small effort to help each one of us understand why is it so important that I need to be careful in choosing right spouse, right person for my life. And why I should teach my children to choose right person for their lives. Irrespective of what the culture says, I'm not going to talk about the culture, but I just want to limit myself to the Word of God. I just want to teach what the Word of God says. I do not know how you're going to receive it, but I want to be very, very fair because tomorrow again, like I was saying this to Rebecca, tomorrow again I'll be standing before the judgment seat and I have to answer him. So I, I don't want to put myself in problem. Even if you guys will be in problem, that's okay. But I don't want to be in problem. So I want to be, I want to be very, very fair. I want to only speak what the Word of God says. And the Word of God is so clear over here. And Abraham was very clear about this concept. Not only Abraham, if you see about, about his son Isaac, if you see about his grandson Jacob, all these three guys, they were very, very careful about this particular factor of seeing that their children are married to the ones who know God. Who knows God. Let me just bring this before you. See, Genesis chapter 27, 
verse 48, the last verse. Genesis chapter 27, the last verse, and then 28 verse 1. Genesis chapter 27, the last verse, 48. Uh, 40. And Rebekah said to Isaac, for, I'm reading from 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? 28.1 Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and what is the next word? What does the word charged him means in English? He commanded him. He sounded stern, firm. Am I right? That's what the word charged him means. Okay, so what did he charge? Charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Am I with you? All these three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these three men, they were very, very clear about this concept that our children, especially in case of, in case of uh, uh, Isaac and Rebekah, they, they had learned the lesson because Esau, their first son, had married a girl from Hittites. And because they, he had married a girl from Hittite, they were going through lots of troubles in the family, especially about religious activities. And therefore, the verse that we read speaks about the weariness of Rebekah. And she says, what meaning is for my life? If this continues, and so I'm going to make it sure, at least, at least now, that my second son, Jacob, he goes and marries right girl. Dear brothers and sisters, I, I do not know, I'm, because this is not from the word, but I just wonder, is, was that one of the reasons why God identifies himself by saying God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and then God of Jacob and not God of Joseph, because Joseph was married to an Egyptian girl. So it is significant not only among us, but in heaven. God is identifying himself with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these three were the ones who had this very clear understanding that my Children are going to marry only the ones who know Jehovah. Ones who know God. And it's a very, very important thing for you and for me because that's what Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. In fact, the way he explains is, is, so, is, is so clear. If, if you come into 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, where we had read, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he goes on to explain that. And if you read the following verses, I'm sure the verses themselves are so clear that we don't have to really, really need any understanding from any third person. Because this is what it reads. He says, For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? He goes on to say, and what accord has Christ with Bilal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement, now this is, this is really strong. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Dear brothers and sisters, he is so clear. He is so clear and he is helping each one of us to understand. Please know this, that we are not supposed to get yoked with unbelievers. 
And I know I am on Facebook right now, but it's okay. That's what my Bible tells me. And that's what I am here to preach. We need to be really, really careful. Not only because, just because you are married or you don't have to worry about your marriage now. Just know that we have many under, under us whom we need to train and teach and mentor and disciple. And unless we start speaking to the next generation, they will always have this excuse. You never said that to me. I read that, but did, did that matter to you, dad? Did that matter to you, mom? I did read from the Bible. I know that. But I thought for our family, it's okay. I thought the people with whom I am, it's okay. You never spoke that to me. You never expressed that to me. And instead of expressing this view to them, when they have chosen someone, probably it is really good to express this view to them when it is time. When they are growing, we need to sow these seeds into their heart, into their mind, so that they are careful, they are aware what is right and what is wrong. Not only because your physical parents of your children, but also for the children in the church where God has put you. If you get an opportunity to speak to a young adult or a youth, please drop this word into their life. Because this is going to determine how their future is going to be. And it's very, very important, not only for them, but for the body of Christ. We cannot move away from this truth, my dear brothers and sisters. Although the world may be teaching different things, and it's going to, let, let me be very clear, the world is going to teach lots of other things. And every time, I think about different things that are getting introduced in the society. I always feel anything that Bible says exactly opposite, the world will propose. And then comes the question, where do I stand? On the word of God or on the word of government or word of society? Where do I stand? The choice is going to be tougher in coming days. Already it's getting quite tough. But it's going to be more tougher in coming days. We, we come from a place where we were in minority and everything was against the word of God. Right from the school to the workplace to the family. Everything would be against the word of God because there is everywhere idols, idols and idols. And there you need to stand on the word of God. And you can, I tell you. The world is standing and you and I can here. Provided we are committed to the word of God. And also, provided we know the word of God. Many a times, people do not know. People do not speak about it. We speak about all other stuff in our family. Why shouldn't we talk about the future of our children? We need to teach them. We need to speak these words into their life. And if we do not speak, again, the things will go hayward. We need to tell them that we cannot be unequally yoked. Now, getting yoked, I do not know if, if you understand that because I, I was thinking about this and I was wondering whether really people understand what does getting yoked mean because I, I don't know if there is anyone over here if you have physically seen a bullock cart. Have you seen a bullock cart? Bullock cart? Oh, really? Oh, not in India, here. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I was going to take you, Grab. <laughs> how many of you have literally seen how two bulls are used with a yoke to plow the farm ground? How many of you have seen that? Good job. You, 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 are, you have surprised me. Many of you have seen. So you know that there will be two... Andrew and Blair, would you mind coming here, please? <laughs> Andrew, you both are of similar height, and you both are looking so young today. <laughs> so if, if Blair stands here, and Andrew, uh, you can face that side, please. Okay, Andrew, stand here. So this, these are the two bulls. Okay. 
Name of one bull is Andrew, another bull is Blair. Such a good name, okay? And then you have T, T-shaped wooden yoke. One goes on this neck, another goes on this neck, and this will be on the ground with a hook there, okay? And then you make these bulls to walk ahead, and this hook will mow, plow the ground, which is the hard ground. If Sean, would you mind coming here, please? Maybe you can come here. If you have this size of bull, one is shorter, another is taller. See? It's going to be unbalanced. That's right, Linda. It's going to be unbalanced. Are you getting me? And you cannot plow the ground properly. Am I with you? So you really need to select right pair of bulls. They need to be equal so that you can do the job right. Are you getting me? Can you see that? Thank you so much, guys. And that's why Paul is saying, what does he say? Do not be unequally yoked, but yoked equally because we have to do the work of kingdom of God and then he gives lots of examples why shouldn't they because righteousness and lawlessness they cannot be together righteousness had to be with righteousness he goes on to say light cannot be with darkness either two has to be light or two has to be darkness then he goes on to say Christ cannot be with Belial God cannot be with the enemy. Oh, he goes on to say, what part has believer with the unbeliever? And then towards the end, the temple of God and the idols, they cannot be together. And unless there is unity in between these two, they cannot walk ahead long. There are going to be lots of problems if these are unequally yoked. And he is so clearly speaking this about the marriage. About the marriage. I remember when I was in university and uh, uh, doing my post-graduation. So that was the age group of 22 to 25. Most of us were 22 to 25. And that was the age group when we were all boys. I was in hostel boys hostel so all the boys you know sometimes we would be talking about the marriage because we all knew the moment we finish our post graduation we'll be on to job and everyone will be you know getting married and so sometimes among these boys we would have this talk and like i told you i was the only christian there and so all my friends a group of 16 we would be talking about marriage and then this would be the talk uh, uh, and one of the one of the talk would be you know what so, so this is what used to be said. You know what? Whenever you choose a girl to marry, choose someone of your, uh, or your own office or uh, someone who is in your own profession or someone who is as educated as you are so that, uh, so that there, will be, there will be proper understanding between husband and wife. So these were the talks. And then, and then you know, when everyone is sharing, some, some, some thoughts will be like, you need to have from similar family background because, you know, I come from India wherein we have lots of caste system. So similar caste, so that helps. All these talks would be there and then the question would come to me. So Avish, what is your view on how to, how to select a wife? And I'm, I would just think that that is my opportunity. And I would simply say, well, I just need someone who loves God. That's it. Rest of the things he will take care. But I need someone who loves God. And they would be like, okay, whatever. Let's go. <laughs> but that was okay. But mm, that's, what, that's what the word of God so clearly says. I, I want to bring something interesting before you. Come to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. We are going to read verse 3 and 4. 
Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3 and 4 reads. Now this is, uh, this is God telling to these uh, Israelites. Nor shall you marry, nor, nor shall you make marriage, marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Okay, now this is important, okay? Next verse. For, why, why, you, shouldn't, why you shouldn't be unequally yoked? Because, for they will turn your sons away from following me. How? To serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Do not give your sons or daughters to unbelievers or receive because this is what is going to happen. Even before you realize, they will take your sons away from following me and they will make serve other gods. Come to verse 25. Of that same chapter, verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 25 reads, You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be, what is the word, snared by it. It will be a trap. Even before you realize, it will be a trap. You will be snared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. How clear and powerful it is. It is an abomination. Sons, daughters, be careful. Because even before you realize, don't get trapped into the feeling of love. And then starting to justify, things will be fine. He is not or she is not the way you think. He or she is different. Dad, he will be fine. Before you realize, that will be a trap by the enemy. And know this, that it will be an abomination to God himself. We have two strong examples about this, isn't it? We have the example of Samson in Judges 14. We have the example of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11. The strategy of Solomon was very strange. Whenever I read about him, I feel like, man, what you know what he used to do? If he would find a kingdom, a nearby kingdom, his way of conquering that kingdom was not taking the army and fighting against them. No, he had a strategy. What he will do is he will marry the daughter of that king. And now because he has married him, that kingdom belongs to him. But he never realized that when he is marrying to this girl who is belonging to someone who doesn't love God or honor God, she would be bringing her gods with her to Solomon. And then Solomon, out of obligation, would allow her to build a temple for her gods. And then in due course of time, he himself would be worshipping those gods. And that's how he started moving away from God himself. It was a trap. It was a trap. He got caught into that before he even realized. He thought he is expanding his kingdom. <laughs> he never realized that he is on wrong journey. And, that, and that's what happens many a times. I have heard boys and girls saying, you know what, if I marry a non-Christian, his or her soul will be saved after I get married. I have heard young adults saying that. I have heard people saying that. And, and there is a reason why they say that. Because they see many marriages wherein they have married non-Christians. And look at their families. They are doing so good. And look at the Christian families. They are horrible. They keep fighting. They do this, that, that. It is better to marry someone whom I Love. You know that? You, you understand that, isn't it? World has taught us through Bollywood and Hollywood so much that love, you know? 
she is good to me she takes care of me blah 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 my foot and then you want to get married and you want to convince your parents dad don't look at this bible look at this man look at this girl she is so good and she comes from such and such family it's a trap it's a trap first corinthians chapter first corinthians chapter 7 verse 16 what does it read it goes on to say so this is paul for how do you know o wife whether you will save your husband or how do you know o husband whether you will save your wife that's a straightforward question you know why the, he is putting this question if you read the earlier ones you will get to know that this same thing that there are people who feel that they are doing some big thing for the kingdom of god that if i marry someone who is non believer she comes or he comes into the kingdom of god and one more soul is saved hello jesus has done everything on the cross to see someone saved and not by your action or your word any soul can be saved please remember that and the kingdom of god does not want any such arrangements to grow his kingdom no no but you know who is teaching this the church people themselves have started talking about it and it's okay if we do that no it's not okay it's wrong my bible clearly tells me i don't know what version bible you use but my bible clearly tells me that is an abomination to god himself and the thing that he is speaking about here the when when paul is telling telling over here when he says that uh, uh, if let me read for you from uh, from verse 12 but to the rest i not the lord say if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him let him not divorce her so this is after marriage so after marriage in between from this couple husband and wife if one person becomes a christian and other person is not yet a believer that's where he is saying that brother the husband should stay with his wife if she is willing to be with him because you are christian believe me our god is a god of household even if one person becomes a christian the blessing comes on the whole household and because of your behavior because of your nature the other person and your children they will be saved but he is not speaking this to do before marriage he is talking about after marriage from this couple if one person is getting saved stay with her or him says the word of god says the word of god my dear brothers and sisters you remember how when when abraham got to know about sodom and gomorrah he had very clearly started negotiating with god because he knew god and he said even if there are 10 people who are righteous i will save the whole town so is true with the family if you, even if one person is saved in the family he says i will save the whole family my blessing will be on the whole family they are not they have not yet received salvation but there is grace because of one believer in that family other day i was hearing to one of the stories from a lady who became christian and all throughout her life she was praying for husband that he will become christian he will receive christ but to her dismay he never vocally claimed that he accepts jesus till the time he was alive and he died and her heart was always broken but for to her surprise 
her four grandchildren, they kept on seeing the lifestyle of their grandma. And these four grandchildren, they are living a Christian life. And when, they, when she sees them, she realizes what God was doing even when she was not aware. And the testimonies of all these four grandchildren always has been, we saw who Jesus is in our grandma. Although our parents were not Christian, but we saw our grandma and therefore we chose to become Christian. How wonderful. How wonderful it is. There was one one sister in this congregation when uh, two years back she was here for one year. Uh, now she is in Australia with her son. And she was sharing this testimony with me that when she had become Christian and her husband and her children, they were not Christian, so she became Christian. And so she found that in the church there were six other women whose husbands were not Christian. So she, she made a small group and every week on one specific day, these seven women, they would get together and pray for their husbands. Lord, save our husband. Save our husband. And she says, in 10 years of time when she was there in Auckland, the six women, other than hers, the six women's husbands became Christian. And only her husband had not become Christian. And she's still praying. She's still praying in, in Australia. By this time, her husband has become quite open. You can speak about Jesus to him and all, all the things, and he is absolutely fine. But she is still praying. And your prayers can change life. The grace is there. But hey, remember, these words are after marriage. Don't apply them before marriage. Don't try to be over smart. And trying to apply it before marriage and going into marriage with that relationship and then inviting lots of problems, not only in your generation but in following generation. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right. <laughs> I don't know, all of a sudden this morning I came across one verse which I want to read before you. If you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, this is what the first part of this verse 35 says. And it reads, And if they want to learn something, so he's talking about women, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. Right? So when I read this, whenever I have read this verse, I have always felt, man, I don't know about the wives, but men need to be good having good knowledge of the word of God. Someone may not ask you, but tomorrow your wife may ask you, Avish, tell me about this verse. What do you understand from this verse? What is the meaning of this verse? And I need to be a good learner of the word of God. Men, we need to be good learner of the word of God. And that was something that I always thought. Look out for a partner who is good learner of the word of God. So that you can talk to him or her about the word. You can ask him. Now just tell me, if this man about whom the Paul is speaking, if this woman does not find her husband who doesn't know the word of God or has no idea about the word of God, what is she going to do? She's going to again go to other people then. Men. 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 Heads of the house. Be the good student of the word of God. So that not only we teach our wives, but also children. Men. Let us be men. Although what is world trying to teach is different. But let us be men. According to the word of God. And our manhood will be in understanding the word of God right. And we teach others. Time is getting tougher, my dear brothers and sisters. Things are getting different. And probably this is the urgent time to help our next generation know about this. Let us not miss this so that we do not create problems for next generation. Let us speak bluntly to them. Son, daughter, this is how it has to be. Let us know 
in that way. Amen? Amen. Let's close our eyes then. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word is a lamp for our path. The light that you give us from your word, the wisdom that you give us from your word, the understanding that you provide us for our life from your word. We just want to thank you for that, God. We thank you for this instruction manual for our lives and father we take this moment to pray for our young adults we pray for our brothers and sisters lord when they are going to take this decision to choose a life partner for themselves god lord we pray that your holy spirit will guide them holy spirit will lead them in the path of righteousness Dear Heavenly Father, we just take this moment, even as brothers and sisters, we pray for our family members who are sick, God, Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will touch them. Wherever they are, if they are in hospitals, if they are at home, God, Lord, we pray that you will extend your hand and touch them, God, and heal them from all the weaknesses, heal them from all the infirmities, God. Let all the strongholds be broken down in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, even over here, Lord, if there is anyone who is going through any struggle, any physical struggle, any emotional struggle, any, any spiritual or financial struggle, Lord, we come against the strongholds and we command them to be broken down in the name of Jesus Christ. Any chronic diseases, I come against them in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we speak your healing. We speak your deliverance in each one's life, O oh God, Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray as we have heard your word, allow us to be the doers of your word as well. And your name be glorified in every word and in every deed. For we ask this in the loving name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, God. Amen.